What I would like to do following on from Frank's presentation is to explore the drivers or what's going on behind the big drivers of change with a view to um, getting you as a group during the workshop sessions to consider five questions which I've identified in advance. So I'll just read out the questions quickly at this stage and repeat them towards the end so that hopefully you can reflect on how my presentation feeds your understanding of these issues. So the five questions are, given the situation described in this presentation, the one I'm just about to do, <laughs> How should or could financing models evolve to manage the challenges of the future? The second is, are there any strategies can, that can be developed to deal with the problem of stranded assets? The third, if a new paradigm for sustainable methods develops rapidly, how would you create a strategy to take advantage of this. Four, if raw material constraints intensify, as seem likely, what are the solutions available? And the final question for your consideration, new markets are likely to emerge to respond to the increasing number of climate, change, climate events and natural emergencies. How should dredging companies prepare for this? So these are the five areas I'd like you to think about while I'm talking through this, the material. Um, the perspective, as Rene had highlighted in the beginning, is to raise your eyes to the horizon, to look into the middle distance, into the future, um, generally with a, with a sense of five years and on outwards. Uh, business models are often quite tied into the period between now and five years. So thinking long-ish term. Now all these issues are, uh, have different characteristics and obviously we'll need different ways of analyzing them. Okay, so what Frank identified, highlighted, and thank you Frank for uh, allowing me to steal your first slide are the drivers of change. This, from an economics point of view, would be what, what's creating demand in the market. And the demand for your services, your business, for your activities comes from these sources. What I would like to look at is how do we uh, deal with the what we call the supply factors. Now, that isn't actually supply so much as this evolving structure of this market. So I would like to highlight four issues in my presentation. The demographic issues, which Frank uh, uh, talked about, but I'd like to look at certain aspects of that which I think are useful. Uh, technology and innovation, uh, how obviously how this affects the way we do things. Um, Serge will be talking in terms of innovation in far more detail about this, but to feed it in at this stage as a policy-related issue. The third uh, is the nature of economic growth, trade, and economic activity. Um, it is changing very fundamentally, which will change the way in which um, demand is articulated by different countries in different ways. And the final one is about raw material constraints. The shortage of sand, and aggregates, and how it's feeding into the way we look at these things. So we have, in effect, enormously powerful demand. In fact, if you look at your sector relative to any other sector in the global economy, you have an assured future. Global warming, demographics, lifestyle changes, etc., 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 are incredibly compelling forces behind everything that, that your industry provides. But the complicating factor comes in the way in which these supply perspectives interact with demand perspectives. And that's what I'd like you to consider. So uh, the, headline, consider the headline issue is, 
If you consider business as usual and project that into the future, is that going to be a viable and sustainable model? Uh, my answer generally would be no, but obviously it's more complicated than that. But if that's not the case, then what shape should, uh, sh should business models assume? What role should you play? Uh, and what is your position in that whole transformational uh, process? So the drivers remain powerful, but the business response may need to adapt. Okay, um, I love symbols. Um, the double-headed eagle. It doesn't exist, as we know. Well, we hope it hasn't been bred on a farm in America or somewhere. Should not exist. But it's symbolic of what? It's symbolic of, in the Austro-Hungarian context, but it's actually an ancient Turkish symbol of looking east and west. The political management of being a middle power. You have to look in both directions, east and west. But in my presentation, I'd like you to think of this in not just geographic terms, because for sure we have to look east and west, but in, um, in the way you do things. Uh, is it a problem that your company can address alone? Or is it a sectoral problem for the whole industry, looking both ways at the same time? Is it something you yourselves can address in your prof professions? Or is there something much, much bigger at work here? Um, and to consider the multiplicity of perspectives that you have to now incorporate into the way you do everything. Combine this with a, the modern reality. Uh, we live in a deeply uncertain and unstable world, that rate, the rate at which political change and strategic change occurs is, is unprecedented. And so this ability and skill to assimilate a huge amount of diverse information at once, looking in all directions, is, uh, is becoming preeminent as a, a requirement. Having said that, I'll say the opposite. From an economics point of view, and I emphasize this entirely from that point of view only, there are only three economies that are big enough to shape the way in which this engagement, your engagement with the world occurs. The United States, the European Union, and China. The rest are too small. It doesn't mean they won't get the right answers. It doesn't mean they have, don't have the right ideas. It doesn't mean that they, have, they don't have the right to pioneer policies. They are not big enough to shift the numbers on the scale needed uh, if there is to be a major paradigm shift in the way we deal with these things. And it relates back to a simple law of economics, uh, market size, economies of scale. Size matters. Investors respond to market size. Investors respond to economies of scale. And unless you're big, and super big in this case, you're not going to be able to move the principal numbers around. Japan is the fourth we could think of in that hierarchy, but Japan is relatively small. So although it's an enormous economy in this game, it is relatively small. So, um, that's my sense of how things should look. Now, I've put here, I've in highlighted in red, five to 10 years, but I would ask you to lift that 10-year restriction and look much, much further into the, 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 the future. Now, conventionally, in looking into that middle distance, we adopt various scenario planning um, scenarios. We adopt various scenario planning uh, approaches. And um, I've just highlighted a few of these here, but within each, I would just like to uh, mention a few points. So, um, sorry, excuse me, I just need to check that I'm on time. Rene, am I okay for time? Okay. 
So taking um, the traditional sources of financing, um, global oil prices, as Frank showed, are relatively down. Global commodity prices, global raw material prices have, have fallen relative to everything else quite substantially in the last few years. The big economies which were generating huge surpluses from these three sources, plus of course merchandise trade, are seeing a shrinkage in their income. So we have demands, huge demands, but the countries that traditionally generated huge incomes from trade, oil, commodities, raw materials, are finding that in reverse. The scale at which it's in reverse is astonishing. 1.5 trillion dollars a year is now not being transferred to these economies. So their deep pockets, which used to drive a huge part of your business, are getting are emptying. Saudi Arabia, for example, is estimated to run out of money in three years. And that's just one example. So if this disappears, then the financing models have to change completely. And what, is the, what are the financing models that, will, that, will, that can be adopted in, uh, in this context? Um, combine this with the reality that countries like China, for example, have three and a half trillion dollars in reserves, yeah, mainly from trade. Three and a half trillion means that the Chinese state can underwrite the costs of almost any bid anywhere in the world which a Chinese company is interested in. How then does a private sector dredging interest compete against a state subsidized dredging, dredging interest? Sometimes we refer to this as capital dumping. In other words, cheap capital is dumped into the laps of big entities which bid for global projects. This is not illegal under international trade rules. So you have no protection against it. And that means companies have to figure out a way to uh, deal with that. Um, the second point, and I'm just highlighting a few issues here. Um, climate change. The agenda is in play. It's accelerating. And if any of the big three economies move very decisively towards implementation and implementation plus commitments, that will redefine the global landscape in almost every area, simply because those countries will attempt, those countries, one of those three, will attempt to create economies of scale which will support domestic producer interests. They do not want a long and tedious and painful transition. By going through that tedious process, they will lose market first mover advantage in the market. They are mo more likely to move very quickly and decisively on a monumental scale. Now, if we compare that or place that against the business as usual approach, so we have huge demand, we respond by building up our, our capacity. If we place the two one against the other, then there is a huge danger that these investments will be wasted in business as usual, whereas the investments that are needed are in the transitional and, and target, new target technologies. But what exactly are those, and how should the transition be managed, uh, is almost as much a political issue as a technological issue. So if China lays down the frameworks, or the European Union, which is more likely, or elements within the United States, like, like California or some states, uh, the change will be very quick. Uh, which goes against our instinct, which is to say we want to change, we prefer as societies to move slowly. 
But we don't create the markets unless we change uh, decisively. Economic growth strategies uh, will change. Um, Frank had showed how growth is flattening out. We're entering an era, it seems, referred to by economists as secular stagnation. Have you come across this rather ugly expression? Secular stagnation means low long-term growth. The early days of 3, 4, 5, 10% growth are over. We're entering an era of low long-term growth, which means we have to be more efficient at what we do, which means technology and innovation will play an increasingly powerful role in sustaining this model, because this model of low long-term growth is not sustainable if Frank's projection of seven billion, seven and a half billion people become nine billion people. Business as usual will not support this. So we have to find new ways of doing it. And again, it links back to the earlier point. Uh, governments will probably, in the big jurisdictions, move quickly to take advantage of this. It's not just uh, an economic model, it's a quality of life issue, it's a, um, a lifestyle issue. Uh, the final point on this slide is raw materials. Uh, we've been watching with increasing um, interest the extraordinary levels to which, uh, the extraordinary extent to which the raw materials crisis in terms of sand and aggregates is becoming a reality. A business model, which is essentially what um, your businesses uh, have built, uh, depend very substantially on these supplies. And these supplies are coming under increasing pressure, political, environmental, local community, strategic, etc., etc., etc. Which means the things you need to do what you do will be more expensive and less difficult to access in a context where there's huge demand for you to do what you do. So how does one get around this? Are there alternatives? Or do we have to be better at managing our raw materials? Or do we see your companies entering into the markets to access raw material supplies as part of their business model and hold on to them, stockpile them somewhere in the world? Or, or what? Um, huge long-term uh, issues tied into this. Again, here I would emphasize the issue of uh, speed and uh, the speed of response. Um, already we see in many parts of the world local governments, local communities uh, em em employing rules and regulations to limit access to raw materials or to control um, this will accelerate, and it will accelerate rapidly for the very reasons Frank has highlighted of this additional population which comes into being. Most will be located in coastal regions, and most will be vulnerable to the depletion of raw materials, and most will respond vociferously and forcefully to stop that from happening. So the demographic driver, which is a great demand creator on one side, is actually going to create the problems on the other. And that is another uh, unknown area of concern, but uh, an area of uh, uh, major concern. I'll end here because uh, time is up. So if I may end by repeating... I still have five minutes. Well, there's one other point that I wanted to cover, but I'll, I'll, I, if I may, I'll end by repeating the five question areas. Then I'll just talk about one other issue, which, is, uh, which I was thinking about. So the five question areas are, given the situation described in this presentation, how should or could financing models evolve to manage the challenges of the future? Second, are there any strategies that can be developed to deal with stranded assets? 
Third, if a new paradigm for sustainable methods develops rapidly, how would you create a strategy to take advantage of this? Fourth, if raw material constraints intensify, as seems likely, what are the solutions available? And finally, new markets are likely to emerge to respond to the increasing number of climate events and natural emergencies. How should dredging companies prepare for this? Okay. These are the questions for the workshop's consideration. Now, the one point I wanted to just mention before I uh, hand over to Sergei for his presentation is um, the, something that makes a link between some of the issues I've just talked about. 80% of new population growth will be in emerging economies, and 80% of that will be in coastal areas. Most of these emerging economies are not one of the big three or any of the big rich countries. They have no sources of financing. And for them, the, it's a question of survival. So for them, the challenge is to find a source of finance which will be able to engage the services of companies like yours to deal with the challenges that they have to address. But currently, there's nothing, there's nothing in position. Um, these communities, these societies, these countries are not going to shut up and be quiet as they're inundated by increasing, uh, an increasing number of events. So there's a political imperative to find a solution to this extraordinary imbalance of wealth and power and requirements, which seems to be at play in the international system. Against a background where we're seeing political fragmentation of the international system. The three entities I was talking about, the United States, the EU, and China, if they don't cooperate and work at cross purposes, complicate the way in which this um, scenario could play out. So, on that uh, optimistic note, could I uh, thank you very much for being so patient and uh, hand over to Sergei for his presentation? Thank you.